change within ourselves and our relationship to our world through experiencing cannabis and what this plant has shown us, it, you know, through whether you're having a hard time in your life um, and it's PTSD or whether you're just having a really anxious time or the ups and downs of life as well as illnesses, nausea, all sorts of things. So there's all different ways to use cannabis, obviously. For us, we found that even if you're unconsciously using cannabis and you think you're using it recreationally, um, a lot of times you're just unconsciously dosing yourself for some kind of underlying condition. And so really to us, everything is medicinal about this plant, whether you're using it to feel good, to take the edge off this crazy life we live in, whatever it is, you know, and so fast forward and Naturally Mystic Organics found all these different stories coming in from all over the state. And these people don't know each other. And it's the same thing, like at first, what you were saying, Josh, just like, is this real? Is this really happening? How can this plant be really shrinking tumors and cancer cells, you know, killing cancer cells and stopping seizures and all these reports and all these stories just are humbling every day that they come in. I, I bow to this medicine and I'm in humble service. And so when it's required to step up and get political, it's something that's not necessarily in my nature that I've done before. But I feel like it's important that as a community we step up and we represent this cannabis plant as a medicine and we talk and start that conversation about what we need as a community to protect this plant and um, ensure that this medicine is getting to patients, that we are protecting our environment in Santa Cruz in particular with the trees and the watershed and also just being considerate of our neighbors and understanding that a lot of people just, um, they're coming out of prohibition too and maybe they've never done any drugs and they don't understand plant medicines because that's an ancient art form that really is traditional medicine. And, um, and being compassionate to those people that maybe don't understand cannabis and why it's so powerful, but help embrace them in your community and help bring them into the fold and, and educate them and help them feel more comfortable about why we're standing up and, and um, that this isn't just some cosmic joke, it's actually real. <laughs> so that's my thing. Yeah, please. Okay. I, and I really appreciate that because I kind of went off on a bit of a tangent and kind of started getting a little nervous, but I really appreciate the comments there because it's, it, you know, part of the miraculousness of this plant and how it has its interaction with our body is, you know, the only reason why cannabis has any effect on our body is because we have this endogenous endocannabinoid system, this, this internal system that, you know, mammals have evolved over millions of years to have this co-relationship with this plant, essentially, and cannabis as a plant is one of the only plants in nature that produces compounds that just so happen to fit to this receptor network, kind of like a key into a lock and besides what we naturally produce. And so what's really important to recognize is this system in our body, the endocannabinoid system, is sole purpose is to help our bodies to restore and maintain homeostasis. And all, every day, you know, you have various, like, small releases of your endogenous cannabinoids, anandamide and 2-AG, that, you know, you don't really even recognize because they're just releasing small amounts, binding your receptors. Um, but the whole role of the system is, you know, we get sick, we get a fever, it helps us bring us down. You know, mood, you know, you know, every you know, physiological role from things like, you know, um, mood, pain, hunger, you know, all are mediated by the end of the system in some part. And so, um, you know, it, 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 something I really try to kind of put out in you know, these education seminars that we do at SC Laboratories with collectives that we work with is kind of frame this idea of medicine and practicing medicine and you know, the symbiotic nature of all the systems in our body. And how can Western medical practitioners and doctors you know, put such dogmatic faith behind in their word to give us a certain medicine that's gonna treat our symptoms? How can they 
be fully equipped to actually do their job if they don't even recognize or have learned or had any training in the fact that we have this entire system, we have a family system, you know, it's kind of like practicing medicine without recognizing that we have a respiratory system, a cardiovascular system. You know, it's like one major component to the picture that's missing. And so, so kind of just back in that idea of service and stewardship, it's like we as these, you know, it's, it's profoundly fascinating how this plant kind of it hits us and we become so like impassioned by it and like we want to champion its message. It's almost like kind of like exercises us, you know, and, and you know, and, and bring it in an interesting way, but you know, it, it embodies us and impassions us to kind of speak, you know, and try to help to spread the word. You know, and so, you know, I think it's important to recognize that we as the impassioned members of the community that get it and have been tuned in and turned on, I think we are going to have more effect helping and spreading word in the community and helping people that are going to these ministries every day or people in our lives make more informed decisions on different act, different cannabinoids or different ways of applying cannabis that can heal them, you know, um, because the doctors aren't going to catch on anytime soon. You know, so are, are, you know all, all your you know, family medical practitioners going to, you know, just all of a sudden go take some continuing medical education classes about the endocannabinoid system? It's pretty far off. You know, there's a lot of universities now that are kind of raising up young kind of doctors with this foundation knowledge of the system. You know, there's been a lot of research universities around the United States and around the world that are studying you know, different aspects of the endocannabinoid system. But you, know, you just think about where how far medicine got to this point, you know, built on this kind of uh, prohibition, this very kind of, you know, um, this imminent prohibition against this plant. And now kind of science is coming out and, you know, we're chasing our tail to kind of realize that, you know, the cannabis plant, when it turns out, because of its role in simu simulating the endocannabinoid system, you know, ultimately will probably come out to show that, you know, cannabis is one of humans' primary plant medicines, primary medicines, you know, for health. Because it's such a it covers such a wide ranging, you know, amount of you know um, different conditions. Because you know we have endocannabinoid receptors all over our skin, you know, all throughout our central and peripheral nervous system, all throughout our immune system, throughout different organs like our liver, kidneys, lungs, or throughout our microbiome and our digestive tract. And so, yeah, I mean, it's a it's such an important system to help to regulate homeostasis of other systems. And 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 lastly, the, I don't even carrying on, but um, there's this whole kind of, uh, there's this hypothesis, this, uh, this research came out with a guy named Ethan Russo um, a few years ago, um, and he, he, he titled this kind of scientific paper uh, he put out called the Clinical Endocannabinoid Deficiency uh, Syndrome. And it's this paper that kind of describes, you know, the root etymology of certain types of disease and disorder, things like migraines, things like fibromyalgia, things like certain types of digestive tract conditions, you know, gastrointestinal tract disorders, and certain types of autoimmune conditions are being described as an endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. So for whatever reason, whether it's like, you know, response to vaccination or pesticides or, you know, some epigenetic stress factor from when you were born, but for whatever reason, you know, your endocannabinoid system isn't firing correctly, so you experience this type of disease. And, and you know, just over the last five years, there's been, you know, in what started as this hypothesis of this clinical endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome is now you know one of the most studied kind of topics in endocannabinoid research, you know, and it's all just substantiating this idea that you know when the endocannabinoid system is out of balance, you know, a lot of disease and disorder can kind of become you know can manifest and 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 whenever and so these certain conditions like you know what we're realizing you know fibromyalgia and migraines like, there aren't very many medicines and pharmaceutical drugs that have very you know specific effects in like, you know, really treating those conditions. You know, opiates don't really work in fibromyalgia, this neurologic pain, but it seems that cannabis is being, showing itself to be more effective. And so, so the whole idea of this clinical endocannabinoid deficiency, uh, endocannabinoid syndrome is suggesting that, yeah, the root cause of these conditions, you know, might very well be your endocannabinoid system out of whack, so supplementing with plant cannabinoids, you know, might be one of the best things that you could do. I just have a quick, quick man look at a few, like, pretty much covered the endocannabinoid system, but it's, it's, it's not that that crazy that we don't know that much about the endocannabinoid system. We, 
we didn't even discover the first cannabinoid receptor until 1991. So for years and years, we knew THC made you, made, made you high, but we didn't know why. And, and so in 91, they synthesized the first cannabinoid receptor, I think it's like a few years later, the second one, and since then there's probably three, three other ones at least. Um, and, and, and the same thing with you know the actual chemicals that activate those receptors. So this whole system is, is a relatively new discovery. And and uh, but yeah, and then you have this one plant that you know blocks some receptors, activates other receptors. Um, it, it, you know, it, it's all these chemicals that kind of just play with the system, and, and it's really amazing. It's just it, it, you know it's just so new that a lot of doctors have were never trained on the endocannabinoid system. There's maybe and then then you add to it the, the kind of prohibition. Um, and, and, and so there's maybe a handful of, of real legitimate scientists that have any kind of funding that they can, have been able to do the work up until maybe the last few years. So I, I think, I think you know, what Al was saying is that's just kind of the first little tidbits that are coming out. Um, you know, you start to see a lot, a lot better understanding, a lot better realization that, that yeah, it's pretty amazing and, you know, with this, this system and, and we'll find other ways to kind of, um, I guess, play with it. Um, and, and, you know, if you look at kind of the, the, the natural evolution of the plant, cannabis is one of the oldest domesticated plants. You know, cannabis was domesticated before rice. And, 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 and you know, there's thousands and thousands of plant medicines, but the, the first one, you know, that, 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 you know, humans picked up to actually domesticate happened to be this plant. And, and, and there had to be a reason for it. And if you look at land-raised strains and strains that um, kind of have been untouched by humans, they had a lot greater diversity in the cannabinoids. And, and, and you know, so so you know, ancient man was just trying to get high. He was, you know, it had to have more importance than that. And and you know, over the years, the drug trade has kind of driven the the, the breeding of cannabis. And, and you know, obviously, you know, the drug trade wasn't testing the cannabis and finding interesting cannabinoids and trying to breed for those. They're just trying to breed for the I think actually the highest. And so now what we see is everything is very high in THC. And once you know, I was at at Steve I was I was testing the strains and we saw the very first you test thousands and thousands and thousands of strains and well hundreds and hundreds of them at that time because we were just starting out. Um, and you'd see a lot of THC, maybe fifteen percent, maybe twenty-five percent, but still a lot of THC and very little of anything else. And all of a sudden one one test came through and there's a brand new peak on your chromatograph and never seen it before and that was I think the blueberry blueberry cut that uh, blueberry. Um, yeah the blueberry OG that, that Harperside had that that's high in C B D and that and, and then all of a sudden well, what is this? Just because it was new and interesting and unique and then you start reading you see there's you know a lot of um, you know a lot of anecdotal events on C B D and so people started using it and then the next thing we know now you're seeing a movie for C B D B and T H C B and C D C and it's going to be a slow process, but I think as you see some of these other cannabinoids come up, they'll be a bit powerful as, as CBD. Um, so, so you know, I think kind of shifting away from you know just the drug trade driving everything and, and being able to actually have some sort of idea what's in what's in the plant besides just THC because THC you don't you don't need a lot of like there's no plant has THC in it, but you know if it does have CBC. Um, you know, you're not going to get high. And you, those are probably the strains that got thrown away and they got right away. And um, and so I think there'll, there'll be a kind of a, um, a parallel plot of, of kind of research into these these other cannabinoids, and we'll start hearing more and more about you know kind of zeroing in and getting specific with you know using cannabis as medicine, um, and, and, and what cannabinoids to use for what and what dosages, um, and, and hopefully the reading will keep up with that and, and you know stay a plant-based medicine, and, and you won't you know someday have to take your THC pill and, and, and you know always be you know kind of plant-based medicine. Because you know, just because plant based doesn't mean it's any less powerful. A lot of your pharmaceuticals come from you know natural sources. They, they go into the jungle and find some weird tree frog venom that helps with you know high blood pressure. And, and, and you know, got this in front of us. That's Excellent. All right, so my work with cannabis. Is twofold. I work with patients at Kind People's Collective. So I work face to face with ailments, with people that are trying to treat certain ailments with cannabis. So I, I work personally um, on, the, on the ground, on the floor, uh, with these with different types of ailments, different types of patients, different scenarios. And yeah, I've been able to see 
you know, personally and on on the job, how cannabis can bring relief to someone, how it can uplift their spirits via giving them a good night's rest, giving them uh, a chance to have less pain, less nausea, less anxiety. Um, from that endeavor, I started uh, broadcasting at KSCO AM 1080, Friday nights at 8 p.m. with my radio show, The Cannabis Connection. And the goal of that endeavor is to reach out to those people that are patients, that are curious, uh, people like my parents, people like, um, you know, anyone in this room that has seen CNN and Sanjay Gupta talk about cannabidiol or, or listen, you know, looked at National Geographic, Time Magazine, or Newsweek. Um, like many of our panel have said, this is a, a turning point in our history. And uh, it's a, personally, I hope that it is a chance for us to reestablish our connection with the earth via this plant and reestablish our connection with each other via this plant. And so what the radio is, it's an opportunity to showcase work that people do in this county and in, in the world, but also to remember those that have uh, built this movement um, via their work, the prisoners, the patients, people that have died, uh, activists. And what I hope is that I can facilitate those voices and communicate a message of hope in this time of uh, change. In a, time, in a time where we're starting to realize, you know, the potential. Um, and so with that is education. I think there's a lot of misconceptions. There's a lot of bad stigma around this plant. And when you look at the science, when you look at the facts, you know, there's a lot of misinformation. And the best way to, to remedy that is open dialogue. So that's what the Cannabis Connection is. It's, it's literally your connection to the pulse of, of the community, but also give yourself some orientation on where, where has it been, where is it now, and where is it going. Um, so there is no, no vote to cannabis in our society moving forward. A no vote is a yes vote for the status quo, and that is unacceptable. So moving forward, education is key. And so we need to just recognize that cannabis is the, the single largest and most valuable agricultural product of California, period. Uh, it is safe and it's a valuable crop. Um, so research is necessary moving forward. Uh, we, need to, we need to teach our, our doctors about the endocannabinoid system. We need to teach our uh, legislators what what you know? What is a responsible way of cultivating? Um, and by regulating the, the plant moving forward, and hopefully legitimizing it as a medical product and as an adult use market, we can hopefully earn those funds and reestablish you know our connection to researching. And like uh, Josh was saying, my my dad, you know, I grew up. My dad was in the pharmaceutical industry, so like it's very. It's very common, all these new drugs are coming out of plant materials or natural based. You know, all, all of the big medicines that we rely on started with a plant, started with an organic biological life form. Um, and that's a beautiful thing uh, to acknowledge is that, you know, we have everything we need to heal ourselves, maybe even heal our economy, our consciousness, and our, our, our society, society by redirecting our focus into more natural means of, of thriving. Um, so, you know, thinking about initiatives, thinking about politics, I, it's very apparent that, you know, there will most likely be an initiative next year. Um, we have legal states in this country. Uh, we, can, we can learn a lot from them. It's actually a blessing that Colorado and Washington happened before California because California is undoubtedly going to dominate or influence the rest of the country. So we have a lot of pressure on us as a state to get it right. Uh, key things that we've learned from Washington, um, 
the, the disconnect when you disconnect the farmers from the consumer via tiered licensing structures, which is already kind of in place here in California. Um, on the medical side with AB 266, it's a law. Um, and throughout this talk, I'm just gonna introduce things and, and if you ever want to follow up, uh, we're here, but you can always check out the cannabisconnectionshow.com. You can always email me and that's kind of my, my work here in this county and in, in this society is to help connect dots. But getting back to Washington, um, they allowed many licenses for people to grow. They, they limited the amount of people that can uh, distribute. Um, and that, that, that is a, a really broken and sad model. But for every 10 pounds grown, there's only one pound sold. And so the, the retailers are the ones that are they're literally have a show pull on the market. And all these small farmers or big farmers that invested and re-evaluated re their, their livelihood are now uh, struggling. Um, a, a positive example is Oregon. Oregon has, you know, they just, recreational sales just started and they have legalized adult use. And what, what it is is they capped the, the buy-in license to a more reasonable buy-in. And um, what that encourages is, is more people being coming involved and, and consequently more compliance. And that's the key thing here is to move from the darkness and into a positive uh, trajectory moving forward is to pioneer positive examples of compliance and responsible ways of facilitating this plan and stewarding this plan in our society. Um, and Oregon is a, is a really positive example of that. Um, just a, key, key, a couple key things I want to just share with you before we think about all of the legalization. The plant is very generous. It's very, it, it wants to live and it just gives and gives and gives. And I think we should maintain that mantra with how we treat each other um, in moving forward. Um, and if we have any say as a, as a public, I know there's a lot of special interests, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of lobbying, there's a lot of powerful people and groups that are already in Sacramento and they're already working really hard on. But what they don't have are the numbers and they don't have essentially the will that we have to mobilize. And you know, cannabis is another issue that is beyond you know uh, an intoxicating, compassionate herd. It's a civil rights issue. It's, it's, it's a personal rights issue. And what we can learn from cannabis can, can kind of set the tone on our personal civil rights and liberties. And I just want to plant that seed that if we can mobilize around cannabis and, and pioneer a positive way of regula regulating it on a medical way and regulating it uh, irresponsibly for recreational use, we may actually have an example of how we can mobilize as a generation to take back some rights take back some, some, some power and restore that to the people. And then once we restore it to the people, we can restore it to the planet. And that's what I want to communicate with, with the show and with my work, is that by caring for this herb, we're caring for humanity. And by investing in this herb and sharing, you know, not limiting who can participate, not setting exorbitant fees that only millionaires can partake in. It's a huge pie. The pie of the cannabis gift is massive. Don't cut it into four pieces. Don't cut it into ten pieces. Cut it into millions of pieces and empower the, the, the people via this gift. It's a gift. It's a huge blessing that we're able to recognize that this plant is not only a, a harm reducer, but it, it's, an, it's a, a medicine and it, it, it helps us you know, return to homeostasis in our bodies but in a lot of ways, it, it can help us return to homeostasis in our consciousness. All right, well, shall we open it up for questions or discussion? It's just if anyone wants to bring anything up, we're here to answer any. 
with the, with like hemp towards um like biofuels or something other than just getting high like hemp as a plant seems like some some research I've done it seems like hemp might be an alternative for like instead of using cars or something like that might be more efficient um, as producing a biofuel or something. Do you know much about all that effects or? or I mean like uh, so some of what I and I, I feel like I, a little bit. Of a, uh, so it's a great question because uh, you know just uh, with, with the way regulations kind of moving forward, you know we're just focusing kind of on you know, the drug type of cannabis, you know uh, recreational medicinal use, kind of cannabinoids is not, but you know big elephant in the room, you know is is hemp, and like ultimately, yeah, I mean when it really comes down to it, it's like it's recognizing cannabis as a strategic national resource. You know, for job creation, for sustainable development, you know, like the innovations happening with, you know, kind of converting kind of hemp, tech, hemp fibers into textiles, composite parts for cars, you know, the, the, you know, the Model T, you know, back in whenever, you know, the early 1900s was, you know, kind of composite, you know, parts of the were made off of hemp, hempcrete, you know, hempcrete is this huge, like, mind blowing realization of like this incredibly, you know, low cost. A high efficacy, you know, kind of uh, building material, you know. So it's like the, you know, you know, when you consider like the dairy industry, there's there's all these like incredibly offshore kind of auxiliary industries, secondary industries created off dairy, you know, ice cream, you know, and cheese, everything else. And so, so you know, we're talking about cannabis, kind of drug type cannabis, medicine, everything like that. But you know, whenever you know the United States starts to really kind of carve up hemp production and, and when you consider kind of where are all the jobs in the United States, you know, you know, how many kids are being pumped through universities every day, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in student loan debt and we shot the job sector of service industry jobs, like all jobs, so how many, you know, with TPP, the trans specific partnership recently has, which is very kind of scary a prospect of what, you know, uh, you know, kind of you know, the idea of free trade and kind of um, you know, how, how we can as a nation figure out how to create, create jobs from within and, um, and to fuel kind of the next wave of you know, green development. And it's recognizing cannabis again as a strategic national resource, you know, as well as you know, one of the you know, powerful tools in our tool belt to help us uh, get to some sort of a green or sustainable regenerative society. Um, but yeah, I mean, kind of biofuel, you know, kind of everything. Omega three six nine fatty acids. If you throw you know a handful of seed and there's tons of different types of seed out, you know birds will always selectively choose to eat hemp seed. You know, um, you know, and it's just some essential understanding of like health benefit. Of it. But yeah, three six nine fatty acids, everything on it. I wanted to add, on the political side of things, one would think that hemp would be legal. Um, the National Hemp Industry Association has been really upset with California. And they haven't been able to legally cultivate yet. Here we have this huge cannabis industry for the last 20 or so years here. So I've had a lot of discussion with them. There are some state initiatives that will have language that will legalize them included in. They might have a little section for that. So they're really happy about that because that could open the door for you know thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of jobs. And just the innovation that happens out in California alone. Um, and the money that's here that could do research and, and um, develop products and actually produce them and manufacture them. So look for that. Um, when the state initiatives come through, I advise everyone to like try and read it or consult with an attorney to translate it for you. Or you know, do your research. Don't just trust what's out there on Facebook because a lot of these people don't know what they're talking about. So <laughs> no offense, no offense, but I, I do like the facts. Oh my gosh, type of person. Well, yeah, well, yeah, that's that's exactly what I was going to say. Uh, the same idea. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to briefly say that you know the um, cannabis and hemp are the same thing. So I think um, you know I, I think uh, that that's a distinction that will be you know kind of um, less and less concrete going forward. Um, all the, the the same species of plant, all that makes a hemp plant a hemp plant as opposed to a cannabis plant, and that's the law is the THC percentage that the flowers produce. So you know, we're talking about a lot of these other cannabinoids that we're going to start, be start, starting to produce in greater abundance for medical conditions. 
And um, you know, a lot of the strains that we test in the medical cannabis market, you know, meet the legal de definition of hemp. They have very little THC, and they're almost all CBD. Um, and so, um, yeah, we were talking earlier about you know the kind of panacea that cannabis is for for medical purposes and for, for just kind of all around health. And then um, you know you start talking about things kind of provides. I mean, you shouldn't separate them out because it's all cannabis, and, and cannabis and also provides panacea of, of industrial and agricultural uses. And, and, and Alex mentioned all, all the things, plastics, you know. That so, can I add to that? Yeah, Are there a question? Yeah. So, um, except to say that the national hip industry, um, they're actually upset about the confusion in the marketplace because the, what we're talking about, and I know this is weird because it's the only plant that we don't, um, you know, that we separate the name, but the, when they talk about hemp, they talk about industrial hemp, which generally is not grown for the, or for the flowers, it's grown for the stock and the fiber and the seeds and, and all that. And so they do separate it out. And they, they mean industrial hemp, they mean a particular type of strain that's grown. And the research that I've come across as far as um, the medicinal, like, does it stop seizures and the sustainability of taking that particular type of strain, not the definition that we're talking about, like the legal government definition, where if it only has this much THC. Um, but when you actually grow industrial hemp and you try to extract and make um, this CBD thing, the National Hemp Industry Association is saying, no, that's not correct. That, do not confuse with CBD products labeled as hemp. Like, they're actually making that distinction. Yeah, yeah, they're making the distinction, and it's all in, in, in what those plants were, were, were bred to do, and and what um, what uh, um, you know the, the, the actual the, the, the chemicals they're producing are, are a function of that. So if, you, if you're breeding for fiber or if you're breeding for seed, you know that's even going to be different from each other. So um, so yeah, so but it's it's all in the same plant, and in, in that plant, the, the the cannabis cannabis sativa species of plant has the potential to do all of that, and, and it's. it's but well, what's weird is they've told me they're not covered under Prop 215. Like they literally have been up against a wall, brick wall in California. They have not been able to grow hemp. And I thought, how could this be? It's the same, you know, like what you're saying. But unfortunately, these initiatives have to make that distinction because there's so much confusion. Well, plus the plant numbers they need, the, the size, you know, they, you're not going to have yeah. people doing too big crops with three acre parcels or one acre parcels. You know. And that's a big, big thing to recognize, you know, because it's like when it comes down to the cannabis plant, like, you know, if, if CBD is the cannabinoid that's high in a certain hemp cultivar or CBC or CBG, whatever, um, it's not the, it's not like that CBD is different than the CBD produced from ACDC or Valentinex or any of these other strains. You know, and, and so big thing to recognize kind of about hemp is like if you, you know, if you take one cannabis seed and you plant it in a 300 gallon pot, you know, and it's getting 18 hours of life for eight months, you know, it's gonna grow to be like a 10 pound plant, you know, but if you took that 300 gallon pot and you, you planted hundreds of seeds in that same pot, you know, the, the, the plant's gonna grow very differently. You know, the, the plants, the, the roots are gonna be fighting Plant's going to be growing much more fibrous, less you know established as far as flower structure goes, and and so so it's kind of it's a different way of cultivating the plant too. You know, there are you know kind of breeding for different desirable traits of you know that you know when you plant a million seeds in a very small area, you know there are going to be traits that express that are more desirable for people to kind of continue to breed you know out. But but you know the cannabis plant and hemp plant are the same plant. And yeah, and again, it's like you know one of those, those things. It's like how's it grown, and um, for what purpose? You know, as as far as you know, very valid point that Josie was just making, kind of about hemp is you're currently um, through kind of this legal kind of loophole. Um, uh, companies are importing um, you know kilos of hemp hash oil, essentially from different countries like China, you know Switzerland, you know different, all kinds of different areas that are producing industrial hemp. And um, it's not known how it's grown. It's not known chemicals and pesticides are used on it. You know, and so so these are the things that can kind of adulterate or kind of you know kind of uh, smudge what you know the value of CBD hemp is. You know, but you know, I mean, and it's not saying that you know CBD hemp oil from China is bad. It's, you know, it can be grown well, I suppose. But you know, I mean, I've heard of some people importing you know hundreds of kilos of keeped hemp from Switzerland. You know, and so 
keep off the hemp plant and then you know bring it to the United States and extract it, and then that's the CBD that they'll use to kind of cut with the THC, create different ratios for different products. But um, yeah. Pat, so I think that uh, the awesome thing about what you guys are saying is that there's all these different uses of uses for the cannabis plant, and that kind of we can read them back together. So in my mind, you could hypothetically have a field of hemp that is high THC, and the only reason that we're prevented from breeding for that is because of prohibition, what Josh said. And so then you could also have a plant with large seeds for eating and all these things, and then you could call it the prepper plant, you know? Like I think one, you, one plant for everything? I think you'd probably <laughs> always be, be specific um, cultivars to do what they need to do. If you're breeding for seed, you're going to breed just for seed. You're going to want lots of seeds. You're not going to want a lot of seeds in your drug strain. You know? you know, and so, um, and then if you're growing for fiber, you're going to grow the plant. But that's all the industrial model, not like permaculture or hump, you know? The well, yeah. we're trying to create a lot of room for the prepper plant. So I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Multi purpose is one plant. I'm kind of late in, I'm not sure if this is covered. Um, there's obviously got a lot of different, I feel like we're at the beginning of all the uses that you know, could be used for, but I know that we're just going to keep on learning new things that we can use it for. But for the recreational side of cannabis, um, what do you feel are the negative effects, like health effects? Is there negative effects of recreationally taking cannabis? Um, and I'm not saying yeah. this in a negative way because I mean, like, I live, my, my parents like grew it up and down our yard everywhere. But I, I was like a little kid playing in the drying, you know, behind the seat in the drying area. But um, so, but yeah. do you think there's some negative? Well, and I think I think it's I think it's, it, it doesn't do um, any any of any people who are in the industry any good to kind of try and run away from that. I mean, any any substance that you use in excess or or you use habitually and you can't live without, it's probably not a good thing. For a healthy lifestyle, that means, you know, there's there's definitely studies out there that um, you know it, for certain people who may be predisposed to schizophrenia um, at an early age, smoking at, at a young age can 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 bring that about quicker. Obviously, there is some you know some impairment in driving. I'd argue that there's much less impairment than say alcohol and other, you know, some of the alternatives. But that's you know that's that's not you know the whole the whole picture. There's definitely some impairment when you're when you're under on, on cannabis. Um, and, and I think, yeah, there's the um, idea of using an excess. I, I, I know like, the, whole, the whole dab culture and you know, dabs, you, you can definitely you know, really use a lot of cannabis, and that down regulates your system and, 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 and actually you know, alters your endocannabinoid system. The beauty of it is, 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 is your receptor density well, it, it decreases, so you basically stop making, start making as many receptors um, in, in the presence of excess amounts of cannabinoids. They, they bounce back really quickly. Um, the study I read said about 30 days. Um, and so, um, but, but there, there are some, some, some health benefits for certain, or health risks for certain individuals for excessive cannabis use. But the beauty of it is, is in, in looking at it kind of like from the pharmaceutical context, there's very, very few substances out there that, that are as non toxic as cannabis. There's no LB50 established as a chemist. When I get a new chemical in the lab, I look at the LB50 is. And that's the, the, the amount that can kill 50% of laboratory test animals. And so that's kind of like, that's the legal dose right there. And cannabis has never been established. And um, you know, you can't say that about hydrococaine, you can't say that about you know a ton of things that we just take over the counter. You can't say that about salt. You know, you can you can pretty quickly or or caffeine, you know, caffeine, you know, a very small amount of caffeine can kill you. And so so yeah, I mean it, I mean, so to have something that's actually a powerful medicine that you can kind of self-titrate and experiment with is really powerful because you're not gonna die, you're not gonna you're not gonna kill anyone. Else. Um, and, and so, so, so yeah, it, it's exciting in that way. And, and it's the only way we've been able to experiment up until now because there's been no legal state experiments yet. And yeah, I was just gonna add to that point. Um, and and uh, you know, I think uh, you can just could be in very many ways be considered a performance enhancing drug. And you know, I mean, Olympic, you know, athletes, cyclists, football players, NFL, you know, NFL just, I think, it was the NFL or NBA just recently kind of took it off the list of yeah. testing substances. You know, and so, so you can, you know, you very much utilize cannabis, you know, if you're motivated to be motivated and to do very motivating things and to kind of, you know, charge it in your life. But the problem with it also is if you're on the opposite end of the spectrum and you don't have a job and you're not motivated, you can very much use cannabis in a negative way to exacerbate that. And, and you, know, you know, you can kind of see that a lot with the culture and how, you know, kind of 
how young you know kind of people are just kind of just way too adapted out on um, you know kind of hash oils and concentrates. You know, um, as far as like you know negative effects health wise, I think I mean you know you could very much consider cannabis a vitamin. You know, and, and it's like you know I mean THC is THC, and you know there there are um, you know the psychoactive effects and the, the dulling effects that people can experience, and, and you know people that are not motivated in the way they can use it to kind of continuously be not motivated, that's negative. But as you know, as far as the health consequences, um, you know, I mean, you know, famous report called Tashkin Reports. Um, it was uh, Donald Tashkin, you know, showed, uh, you know, he worked for the National Institute of Drug Abuse, um, NIDA, who fund studies that um, look for the negative uh, aspects of drugs and, and try to substantiate those. And so they were trying to show the, the, the effects that cannabis has on uh, cancer, and so they, they took uh, test groups of people that smoke cigarettes, people that smoke nothing, and the people that smoke cannabis, and they found from you know this long-term study that people that smoke cannabis not only have less of a chance of getting um, throat and neck cancer, people that smoke cigarettes, but they also have less of a chance of getting that same type of cancer than people who don't smoke at all. And so it's kind of getting to like the, the whole realization of stress in our lives and 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 our endocannabinoid system, you know, and just just the reality of being stressed and living a stressful life and having all these pressures on us and then how cannabis can help maintain and bring us to homeostasis, you know, and and, and the that the effects that cannabis has on bring effective balance and directly relates to, you know, the way we experience stress, you know, which is then gonna directly relate to um, you know whether or not cancer may drive in our body. And so the turn of the law. So yeah I have I wanted to add. You said about, you know, is it is there dangers for recreational users? And I think it's also the words that we choose create the images that we have in our mind. So I'm leaning more toward, and I'm not the only one, but there's people in this movement that are leaning more toward saying adult use and medical use. And then we have what to do. What about the kids? What about the youth? So separating it like that um, kind of gives me more of an impression of we have people with serious medical conditions, um, pain relief, whatever that is. And then we have adult users that seemingly maybe just want to have a good time with it. And the, the fun side of cannabis, I like to call it, you got to balance that with the heavy energy that it's bringing. Um, and, and then you have um, what effects, if any, or is it having on our youth? And um, there is a recent study out, and I haven't, I'm not you know, the authority on it, but the DPA is vetting that out right now. And um, it was a study done on thousands of teens over a period of 20 years with cannabis use. And they tried really hard to link all these things, you know, what about brain damage, what about mental instability, what about lung cancer, and it did come out very favorably toward cannabis. So I will say that much, and then you know you can always research further. Um, I think we have to be honest that you know kids are going to use this product. Um, really, we got to talk about um, on the adult or the youth side when they're not using it specifically in dosage, you know, under medical supervision. What are they using it for, and what type of products are they? And traditionally, we look at herbology. We look at the United States Pharmacopoeia, or the British Pharmacopoeia, or the Australian Pharmacopoeia. There is a huge history of plant medicinal use that is safe and effective with zero to little side effects. And the side effects, if they occur, might occur when you're taking other pharmaceuticals with plant medicine. So awareness, education, um, are these products that you're using just flowers, made just coming from the earth as a gift, or in a, a formula as a tincture, or topical, or are they concentrates? So when you move into the realm of concentrates, you move in the realm of like, are you a Native American or a Mayan chewing on a cocoa leaf where there's minute amounts of cocaine, the, you know, uh, going into your bloodstream at a slow amount of time, or is this so concentrated that it has become somewhat of a pharmaceutical and has really concentrated amounts? You know, I use cocoa leaf to cocaine as 
you know, here we have flowers to concentrate. And not to give it any bad effect, I'm not trying, I'm just saying comparatively, there could be side effects when you concentrate any plant medicine, so much so. So that's just something to keep in mind, and again, it come back to education. If you're going to jab someone a huge amount on their first job, they may have a seizure. They may uh, black out. It, it might be too much. So really it's about educating our youth and adults about what are you using this for. Maybe you only need a tiny bit of cannabis to get the effect that you need. Less is best. Maybe start small, work your way up, and see how it feels. And yeah, I want to speak to this too because uh, you know you've got to think about your own chemistry. So cannabis, biologically and the chemical, is not necessarily dangerous or like negative or harmful. But there are types of entourage effects. You know, you have a cannabinoids, and you have terpenoids, and you have this whole cosmic cocktail of oils, chemicals. You know, in the in the actual flower. And certain varieties have a more a chemotype that will provoke a stimulating effect. And if you're an anxiety prone person, you, you take that you know stimulating flower and it gives you and your anxiety spikes, and that could be considered a, a negative effect. It's not that the, the biology that's happening, your heart is racing, you feel like you have a heart attack, or I don't know, yeah, you know, you feel like this is a harmful thing, but it's actually just you have to be paired with the right flower. Each person is unique, each person, I mean, there's so many people that come and I console on the floor where they're like, I just want this one blue dream because every time I do it, I, I feel good, you know? And any time I do something else, I feel sad, I feel too scared, I feel paranoid. So it's not that, you know, the, the flower itself, cannabis and the, the cosmic cocktail of terpenoids, cannabinoids, and you know, those aren't bad. It's just finding what works best for you and knowing yourself going into it. Like, how am I? Am I more of a sleepy person? Maybe I do need a stimulating flower than a sedative indica or a cush that's just gonna knock me out. Or am I, you know, am I, you know, I need that, you know, little bit of sedative, like, cool me down. And I know you've been waiting. Thank you. Um, so I know that you guys have already mentioned about the cannabinoid, uh, cannabinoid receptors in our DNA, and that there's uh, only so much cannabinoid receptors that are being expressed in certain locations. And as time goes by, we're going to know more about new locations and new spots of our body where we are receiving cannabinoid receptors and they are uh, taking action and role. That's where I'm assuming that it inlines our health industry. Um, Knowing that, and knowing that we're going to be progressing in our research and our knowledge of cannabinoid receptors and also the health industry, where do you guys see um, this going in the future as well, like in the industry of testing, modifications, um, in the health clinics, uh, seeing it grow, um, legal-wise, I would like to know where do you guys see this growing in the next five or ten years? One thing I just want to point out before we get into that, all of that is that, and that's a great question, I, I, I hope, what I hope to see is an abundance of genetic diversity and making that open source public belongs to the people, you know, because the more genetic variations, the more uh, diversity we can nurture in our readers, because people don't make strains, plants make strains. Men, you know, I don't make pollen. Cannabis makes pollen, you know, and then they make seeds. And so what I hope is as as we free up the the prohibition and enable people to get involved, I would love to see new new breeders coming in and developing these new types of flowers that will will specifically target uh, you know it's gonna be amazing to see how we can, you know, some people say even like you know, South African Malawi strains help with uh, weight loss. And then there's a lot of cannabis that helps have an appetite, you know, but we'll find different land-based cannabis from different parts of the world that can help for specific things. And the goal is to not have Monsanto come in and patent their 
their Monsanto cannabis and, and have that as the two buck chuck of cannabis moving forward. I hope that we have, you know, the vineyards, you know, the, you know, Pliny the Elder and Lagunitas of cannabis where it is beautiful and it's diverse and that anywhere you go across this great world, you have these heirloom varietals that are very special and that help with so many different ailments and that reflect the geography and reflect the, the, the flavor of, of where it comes from. Yeah. And diversity is a really, really, really big point, you know, because, you know, to, to your question, you know, um, um, you know on, on diversity, you know, it, it, we all are so different from one another in the cannabis plant that there's so variation in it, you know, um, the more that science kind of comes out every day about, you know, novel endocannabinoid receptors, you know, different ways that different plant cannabinoids modulate these receptors. You know, for a long time in the research community, doctors were perplexed on why topicals worked. So they're like, THC doesn't, you know, if you use rub hash oil on like a cancer lesion, they couldn't really figure out why it was that there was any beneficial effect. But it turns out that you have CB1 and CB2 receptors, like millions of them throughout your dermis layer. And so, so you know, more and more, you know, as kind of the information comes out, we realize that where these endocannabinoid receptors are, and that they're an educated community, you know, and and a very diverse um, kind of community creating products. So it's like it's breeding all these very novel cannabinoids and terpenes, and then taking all the, the those very amazing diverse strains, and then creating all the novel products from. You know, topicals to suppositories to sub sub mucotinous uh, kind of tinctures, you know, to kind of inhalables, kind of, you know, like, um, you know, there, there's so many different administration routes to cannabis, and, and there's there's an intelligence to each type. And so, so it's like, you know, where the receptors are, you know, and, and, and so, you know, and, 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 and recognizing that we all, you know, I mean, we, you know, each one of us in the room have different metabolism rates, you know, we have different weights, you know, and, and so, so just based off that, you know, eating cannabis can, you know, and eating THC can so widely, you know, affect, you know, you know, us from one person not really feeling high at all from eating 20 milligrams of THC to one person potentially being hospitalized because how rapid their metabolism rate is or, or you know, um, and so, so it just kind of, yeah, kind of chase, it's just, yeah, it's like, uh, you know, the, the diversity of plant needs to also equally be represented in diversity of products and administration rates that this plant, you know, are, are taken on. So, so there should be no stifling of innovation. And, uh, you know. I think we should see in the next five to 10 years depends a lot on politics. Um, I think, you know, this, you know, if, if, if the activists out there and, and, and the people who have gotten us to this point, um, you know, rest on their laurels too much right now, I think, I think you're gonna see the Monsanto's of the world very happy to take this over and right. so yeah exactly and, and, and I think you know when you look in California and, and, and the new system that's been created for the medical system um, definitely is is um, complex um, and, and, and you were talking a little bit about the, the licensing system and then you look at what's going to happen potentially with recreational um, you know like you, you're going to have to see the cannabis industry grow up a little bit I mean obviously there's going to have to be room for, for you know companies to get bigger and, and budgets to, to do some of this cool stuff we're talking about. But at the same time, um, if you look at some other states, you look at the state of Illinois, they were going to issue two, two production permits, I think, for the entire state. And, and so um, very easily, too, the, the, the whole system could get monopolized and, 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 and the right people you know, kind of come in and, 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 and try to do, do it that way. And, and big money is going to try and, you know, kind of fell up themselves because that's just the way it works. And, and so I think if, um, you know, if, if people who really care about the plant and care about having a, a diversity of, of genetics and products and, and, and to have choice and, and, and to have a place for the microbrews and have a place for the Budweiser's, um, you know, then, then I think it's, it's going to be on all of us to, to vote that way and to, to make it, you know, make it known to, to the people who make those decisions that, that that's important to us and, and, and we'd be really pissed off if they don't. You know? so. <laughs> Basically, a comment that you guys have been reinforcing what you guys have been saying. 
is that we're essentially taking a different approach to wellness than the conventional model of uh, blanket remedies. And so, it, you know, going into the dangers and the titration and, you know, one side and the other, it's about an intuitive process, which brings us back to ourselves, which will take us back to nature. So, it's one that had in Definitely. Yeah. On, on that point, it's uh, beautiful, and, you know, um, it, uh, I highly recommend kind of, you know, anybody that hasn't read the book or seen the documentary, um, a book called Body of Desire uh, by this world-renowned food expert, Michael Pollan. Um, you know, incredible book, but it kind of, you know, um, you know, and kind of read the book, documentary, but, you know, it takes these four crops that man has cultivated over millennia, you know, from potatoes to apples to tulips to cannabis. And um, it's this um, amazing kind of, uh, you know, concept of how, you know, how, how man has used human, excuse me, um, how human has used, um, you know, these plants for millennia to cultivate for these desirable traits that we want. It was really funny because it typically has to do with intoxication, you know, um, in, in a lot of these cases. But um, but in the, deep, the deeper uh, philosophy of the book and documentary kind of explore this idea of co-evolution, what, what's driving what. You know, we're driving the plant's evolution, but how much does the plant drive our evolution? And we do especially start getting into some of these you know, deeper, wiser kind of plant medicine spirit teachers like cannabis and some of these other entheogens that have been utilized for thousands of years by indigenous cultures across the planet. You know, there is definitely a, a profound, deeper wisdom that seems to fight people that, you know, kind of start using cannabis. And, and I think um, in it, you know, it's, there's a deeper message that's going to save me from the earth. So, oh. just if you guys want to learn more, uh, you can uh, listen to the Cannabis Connection, 8 p.m. on Fridays. If you want to get involved personally, uh, that there's a Cannabis Advocates Alliance Wednesday meetings, the first and third Wednesday. Also, uh, there's Santa Cruz Cup coming up November 8th, which is another great event that will be a nice gathering of the local cannabis community. You can always email the Cannabis Connection Show at gmail.com. And then local places like Kind People's Collective, they have First Friday events. So if you ever want to engage with other uh, knowledgeable people, those are great places. And um, thank you so much for being here. I wanted to add another thing that um, right now we're in a current transition. And what our political action committee responsible for Nation Santa Cruz is doing is to help bridge this transition period by taking what's going on locally and with the state and creating, at least helping to facilitate a clear pathway into legitimacy for the existing cannabis industry. Whether that be patients concerned about maintaining their right to grow and access medicine, or whether that means the businesses that are somewhat invisible here in Santa Cruz County can step forward and get legitimacy in Santa Cruz because they're gonna need it in order to get licensing from the state. So it's rcsantacruz.org and we are, um, that's what we're working on, just bridging that gap and helping us all um, take a stand for this beautiful plan. Thank you. Yeah.